continue to discuss situational factors that influence pro-social helping behaviors. These are factors that focus on when people are most likely to provide help. We'll discuss several, but we'll keep each discussion relatively short. Let's start with one of the most interesting, time pressure. Time pressure is clearly a powerful situational factor, and I'm sure you can all relate to it. Personally, I hate to be rushed, particularly when I'm working on something I find important. But when I am rushed, the pressure really does affect me. Time pressure makes it very difficult for me to focus. It makes me somewhat irritable. And it makes me just want to get the job done as quickly as I can so that the pressure will just stop. I guess it can make me feel somewhat desperate. Well, I'm sure you can see that's a combination of factors unlikely to produce a person who's interested in helping others. The person might be a wonderful person, selfless, generous, caring. But when pressured for time, those traits become less predictive of pro-social helping behaviors. When under time pressure, we're less likely to notice emergencies, people's needs, people's feelings, you, know, you name it, we're just less likely to notice. You might remember that's what step one is all about, noticing that something is happening. And because you're already pressured to do something or be somewhere, you're less likely to accept some new responsibility. That's what step three is all about. And nobody likes to miss deadlines or be late to an important meeting. So in your desperation, you're more likely to avoid helping others when pressed for time because the costs of helping might simply be too high. If you determine the costs are too high, you're not likely to move on to step five, which is to actually provide help when necessary. One of the best research studies in social psychology was conducted by John Darley and Dan Batson in 1973. The bottom line was that seminary students, yes, seminary students, were unlikely to help a moaning, groaning confederate who was slumped in a doorway when they thought they were behind schedule and therefore in a hurry. What made the research study so wonderful is that some of the seminary students were actually on their way to deliver a talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I think you can see that time pressure is a very strong situational constraint that can put a damper on pro-social behavior. Another situational variable related to pro-social behavior is the weather. That's right, researchers have found that people are more likely to provide help on sunny days compared to gloomy days, more likely to respond to a researcher's survey questions, more likely to give generous tips, uh, they're more likely to give rides to hitchhikers, which is a bad idea, but that's a different issue altogether. Why does nice weather promote pro-social behavior? It's probably because nice weather makes us feel good. You know, for example, we associate sun with fun and with friends and with good times. And the key point that I'm trying to make is that our mood, whether we feel good or bad, directly affects our likelihood of engaging in pro-social behaviors. That same mood effect extends to our immediate indoor environment as well. For example, in a research study conducted at a mall, shoppers near a store that smelled like freshly baked cookies were more likely than shoppers near a clothing store, you know, that didn't smell like freshly baked cookies, to help a confederate make change for a dollar. In fact, the shoppers smelling the cookies were almost three times as likely to be helpful. That's probably because the shoppers smelling the cookies were in a better mood, and that's an explanation that's backed up by the data. Why are people in positive moods more likely to help someone than people in neutral moods? There are several potential explanations. For example, we might help others to help maintain our own positive moods. After all, helping others makes us feel good. Another potential explanation is that positive moods trigger positive thoughts, and when we think positively about other people, we're probably going to be more likely to help them when necessary. But, as usual, things can get complicated. Sometimes we're in a good mood and we don't want to mess that up. Helping you might be tough, you know, it might be depressing, it might get me down. In these situations, I might not be willing to mess up my mood by helping you out. So, in this way, a positive mood might actually inhibit pro-social behavior. And if I'm trying to keep my mood light, I might simply refuse to take responsibility for helping you out. These are conscious decisions to avoid helping, motivated by a desire to protect one's own good mood. Negative moods can lead to pro-social behaviors as well, but there's a weaker correlation between negative moods and helping than there is between positive moods and helping. These trends are relatively straightforward. For example, when people feel bad because they feel guilty for something that they've done, 
it makes sense that those taking responsibility for their hurtful actions may be more likely to repair their damaged sense of self-worth by helping other people. That said, if we blame other people for our negative mood, we're probably not as likely to reach out and help others. Instead, we're more likely to distance ourselves from others so that we can lick our wounds. And let's not forget how influential role models can be. In the 1960s, Albert Bandura conducted a series of experiments on observational learning. He discovered how influenced people can be by simply watching someone else, who he would call a model, engage in various behaviors. And in general, he found that watching a model engage in a behavior increases the modeled behavior by the observer. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Bandura had children watch an adult model beat a poor defenseless Bobo doll. They punched it, they threw it across the room, they hit it with a hammer, they kicked it. And then later, the children were able to play in a room full of toys. Children who watched the aggressive model were more likely to engage in aggressive behaviors. They punched the doll, they threw it across the room, they hit it with a hammer, and they kicked it. And that was with boys and with girls. So yes, we learn behaviors by observing other people engage in various behaviors. And sometimes our role models engage in negative behaviors, but sometimes our role models engage in pro-social behaviors. My point is that people, and here I mean all of us, but particularly children, are influenced by role models. So if people observe role models engaging in pro-social behaviors, it's more likely that they themselves will engage in pro-social behaviors as well. Some people are particularly influential role models, most notably people like parents and teachers, and in today's world of TV and online video, celebrities from TV, movies, and social media influence us quite a bit as well. Of course, social influence isn't limited to people we most look up to. Big businesses and other organizations can influence our likelihood to perform acts of kindness also. For example, people who run charities are skilled social strategists. They know how to maximize contributions by applying social pressure. You know, for example, they understand that you'll be more likely to make a contribution after you're told that your friends have made contributions already. They might even challenge you to match your friends' contributions because surely you're just as generous as your friends are, right? It's tough to accept that others can manipulate us like that, but social pressure is real. And at least in this example, it's for a good cause, so plenty of good can come from it. And there really doesn't need to be any middleman, such as a charity, for our friends to influence our pro-social behaviors. If our friends are passionate about something, it's likely that they'll convince us to share in that passion, at least to some extent, because we all want to support our friends. Most of us do indeed want to support our friends, but this can also lead to something very interesting called reluctant altruism, which is helpful pro-social behavior resulting from, you guessed it, peer pressure. Peer pressure, you know, is often seen as negative, but when friends pressure us into helping others, we probably all come out ahead. A great example of that is the ice bucket challenge to support finding a cure for ALS. Many of us participated, but let's be honest, many of us really didn't want to participate. That's what reluctant altruism is all about. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.